Good morning. Welcome to Main Street Presbyterian Church. It's great to have you back for our second in-person service after our period of absence. And I want to say it was an encouragement to be back together last week. I know it was for me and I'm sure it was for those of you who joined us. We don't have many announcements to make today. I uh, just want you to know about the um, this coming week I would have been attending PCA General Assembly, but it has been uh, canceled slash postponed to next summer, um, and that will be held in St. Louis. It would have been in Birmingham this year. And then the second thing I want you to be aware of is our faith promise giving. If um, you have not made a commitment to faith promise, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, we are past our deadline, but we also started our faith promise campaign right at the time our, um, uh, the, the COVID restrictions started. So that made it a little difficult for us. So if you have yet to give to faith promise, please consider doing so. Those are all the announcements I have. Our call to worship com comes from Psalm 67, verses 1 to 5. Hear the word of our God. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. We're going to open with hymn number 345, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. If you'll please turn in your hymnal to that passage and join in singing.
please join with me in prayer. Most gracious Father, who from all eternity searched us out that we might know you, receive us in the name of Christ, that we might be his disciples and hear his word, that we might reflect upon and rejoice in his mighty acts of redemption for us and for our salvation. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may engage in worship wholeheartedly, that we may come before you and seek your face, repentant of our sins, that we may seek your strength, that you would open your word to us, instruct us, guide us, and empower us to keep it. We pray all of these things in the name of our gracious God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, forever blessed. Amen. Please be seated. I'm going to read a section of God's law from Leviticus, chapter 19. We'll read verses 1 to 4 and then verses 11 to 18. Hear the law of God as it is communicated through, uh, to us through God's servant Moses. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make for yourselves any gods of cast metal. I am the Lord your God. Skipping to verse 11. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired servant shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord." We're going to join together in confessing our sin using the confession that's printed in our bulletin. If you'll please join with me. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And we have these words of pardon and assurance from Psalm 51, which we'll be looking at in the sermon later today, or later this morning. The psalmist David writes this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. 
Those are words of great comfort to David after committing heinous sin with Bathsheba, which we uh, talked about a couple of weeks ago in our sermon series on the life of David. Uh, We need to hear that. Uh, We walk into this sanctuary week after week carrying a burden of our sin. And we need to know that God is gracious through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So let us rejoice in our salvation as we sing our next hymn, hymn number 307, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. If you'll please stand and sing. seated. We're not taking our offering, uh, and we're not sure when we will be returning to that, but what we're doing instead is putting offering plates on uh, tables at the back of the sanctuary. You can drop your offering off there on your way out of the church, and therefore we will not have an offering, but I do want us to sing the doxology as an expression of our gratitude for how God has blessed us financially and enabled us to give back to the financial needs of the church. So uh, again, sorry for having you sit. I should have kept you up, but this is a little different for our normal uh, order of service, but please stand and we will sing the doxology.
going to continue to read through portions of the Psalms. We're on Psalm 2 this week. I'd encourage you to turn there and join. I think this is a very comforting word, especially in the chaotic time period that we live in right now. The psalmist writes, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then He will speak to them in His wrath and terrify them in His fury, saying, As for me... I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Amen. Before I begin our pastoral prayer, I want to uh, say a few things to you. I've had uh, a number of text and phone messages, phone conversations over the last several weeks about the current state of affairs in America, uh, and I want to just say a few things about that. Many leaders in our denomination, the PCA, have publicly spoken out against the sin of racism over the last several weeks. That's pretty much a across the board uh, in terms of key leaders in the PCA. If you want to go see a statement by the clerks of our presbyteries and also by coordinators of our committees and presidents of our learning institutions, go to the By Faith uh, online magazine. All you have to do is type in By Faith um, and PCA and it will pop up. You can find that information. Uh, a couple of years ago, our General Assembly passed a racial reconciliation report. It was widely embraced and received with, uh, I would say, at that General Assembly with enthusiasm. If you want to know where the PCA stands on some of these issues, you can go search for that document, Racial Reconciliation Report by the PCA. So this is an issue that, the, that our denomination is aware of and concerned with and speaking truth into. First thing I want to say is this, and I, I would uh, expect that we're unanimously in agreement with this, and that's that racism is sin. And the Christian church should speak out against it at a time of cultural need just as much as we speak out against sexual sins like homosexuality or fifth commandment sins like abortion. Paul wrote uh, a statement in Galatians that uh, I'm sure upset many people, but nonetheless he had to hold to truth. Paul said this, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. And that reminds us that there's really only two biblical categories, and they're not racial they're, they relate to how we respond to God. There are sinners, black, white, yellow, brown, whatever color you want. There are sinners. All human beings are sinners. And then there are those who are saved by the grace of Christ. There are Jews and Gentiles in that category. There are slaves and free. There are men and women. There are whites, blacks, whatever racial designation that we have created in our world those are the categories. And Paul says if they are Christ, then you love them and you embrace them as those who have received the same spiritual benefits that you have. 
Um, so, I think that is that speaks for itself. James also, another apostle. Uh, Paul was really the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter and James were more connected with the Jews. And he says this, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's one thing. The second thing I want to say is this. Being white is not a sin. And we are made to feel that way by statements in the press. And that's a lot like the fundamentalist view that drinking alcohol is sin. Well, that's not what the Bible says. We can't help the color of our skin any more than someone else can help the color of their skin. That is how God created them. Racism is a sin. Being white is not. And I've heard from people who feel this, this guilt and they're wondering, where is this coming from? Well, it's coming from the, the news media. What we have to do is clear away the chaos of the politics in our country and let the scriptures bring clarity and truth and light to us. So, um, do you need to repent? You don't need to repent for being white, but if you have been racist, if you have harbored resentment towards someone simply because they're not of the same color of skin that you are, then maybe you need to practice Matthew 18 and find that person and repent to them. The third thing I want to say is this, that rioting, vandalism, destructive behavior is not the answer. Two wrongs don't make a right. We as the church should not support, encourage, or instigate such acts, but we do need to speak truth in love. Another thing, there are police officers, people in all forms of, of rule. You could be uh, in a position of power in the church, in local community, a police officer. Power is abused. And we live in a sinful, fallen world. So that shouldn't shock us. It should grieve us, though. It should grieve us because it's not the way God intended things to be. But I want to say this. There, there are, and we've seen videos in recent weeks of, of police brutality. Some of that, um, it's coming out more clearly that, yes, indeed, the evidence supports that that is the case. But don't con condemn all police officers because of the foolish acts of a few. Governments and the policing arm of governments are established by God and are for the good of society. That is taught to us in Romans 13 and also by Peter in 1 Peter 2. I know many of you have friends who are of different skin color. And I would ask you to do this. Learn to be sympathetic with minorities in a community, in our community. Many of you do have friends who are African Americans. Talk to them. Find out what they really feel because I'm, I'm going to guess this, that the, uh, the agenda of news media outlets doesn't reflect what all people feel re uh, regarding this set of cultural circumstances. So get to know them. Find out. Sympathize. Empathize. We're called as Christians to be that kind of people. Um, and I want that to lead into our pastoral prayer. If you are struggling with this, if you have questions about this, I am available to speak to you. Uh, if you want more information about where the PCA stands on these issues, I'll be very happy to point you in the direction of some public articles and also statements made by particular ministers on uh, social media sites. Let's pray. O oh, gracious Lord God, you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. We bless you because you are the rock of our salvation. We have confidence in you because, as we just read, you rule over your creation. No matter how the nations seek to plot against you and your anointed one, you sit in the heavens, you're in control, you laugh. Well, Lord, our world is chaotic and turbulent. And 
it shakes us at times, but that's why we need to gather and to be reminded of the truths of your word. You are sovereign. You are in control of all things. The devil will never overcome you, and the devil will never overcome your church. We pray for the church at this time, a time where the church is, is called to speak truth, uh, a time where the church needs much wisdom as we're dealing with health crisis with this pandemic and how best we should care for our flocks and also how we respond and think through some of the, the racial tension and the political chaos. Lord, uh, it's so frustrating, and it, it affects us, and it drags us down at times. And we see the political divides, the racial divides. We even see divides over how to handle uh, issues regarding coronavirus that break families apart. Uh, Lord, it grieves us. We pray that your spirit would rest heavily upon your church, that you would give wisdom uh, to those who are in leadership positions of your churches throughout the world. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we would not lose sight of what is centrally important in the midst of all of the chaos around us. O oh Lord, we pray for our country. And we pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit and the precious blood of Christ, that same blood that broke down the dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles would also break down the dividing wall of racism in our land. In many ways, we see progress uh, over the last 20, 30, 40 years. But we also see uh, that there needs to be more progress, and we need to continue in that trajectory. We pray, O oh Lord, for you to be with uh, those who are called to, uh, to, to bring peace, civility to our society, our government leaders, and our law enforcement. O oh Lord, we... We, can, we, we pray that uh, those who abuse their positions of power uh, would be apprehended and that justice would prevail in those cases. But Lord, we look around our own community and we see so many that do things right. We're thankful. We rejoice at the peace that we have here and the unity that we have experienced here in Columbus. Yes, people have spoken their mind and there have been protests. But it's all been done with respect and love for fellow citizens of this city. We pray also for wisdom to those who advise our leaders about the coronavirus. It's a, uh, clearly apparent that there are some uptick and spikes in cases in certain country or certain states. We're thankful that uh, for the most degree, for the most uh, of the time, that has not been the case here in Mississippi, and we pray that that would continue to hold. We pray for those in our congregation who are in need. We uh, pray for Alice Talley and others who are grieving the loss of loved ones who they may have lost years ago, but the grief and the pain is still real. We ask for you to provide comfort for them. We pray for those who are sick, those who are fighting cancer, that you would bring healing. And Lord, we pray for those in these two categories that they would, that you would create through their grief and through the difficulties of healing, that you would create a longing for heaven where these things don't exist, where death doesn't exist, where pain and suffering no longer exists. Lord, we pray for parents who are raising little ones in these difficult times. It's a particularly hard season of life, but we ask for your blessing upon them. We pray for our uh, Air Force personnel, and we ask that you would continue to use them to train pilots here at this base to protect the freedoms that we have in our country. Lord, we also want to come and give you thanks. 
We thank you for healing many people in our country who have had the um, have had coronavirus, and particularly we pray for Gray Flora's mom and John Ro John Mark Russell, who had it, and probably the closest people to our uh, congregation to have it. But both of them, uh, you carried them through, and you brought healing to them. And for that, we rejoice and give thanks. We thank you for giving Brad Talley strong, persevering faith in his Savior to the very end. What a testimony of your commitment to your promises to us through his life. We thank you for blessing our return to worship last week, and we expect you will do the same this week. Lord, we uh, rejoice that you are our God, that we can speak to you, call out to you in prayer, and know that you hear us as your dearly beloved children. Receive our prayers this day. We offer them through Christ. We offer them to you, our Father, and we offer them by the guidance and the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you'll turn to Psalm 51 for our reading. We broke into our series, our David series, with the return of the ark last week. But before that, we were talking about the season in David's life where he committed heinous and grievous sin with Bathsheba. And now we're going to look at a psalm, Psalm 51, which uh, addresses David's confession of this sin. Let us hear the word of our God, Psalm 51. Beginning in verse 1, David writes, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the sacred heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. This is the word of the Lord. You are familiar with the, the story of David and Bathsheba. It has been one of the, the more uh, clear stories of the disgrace of sin and of falling into uh, moral sin, sexual sin, covering it, covering it up or attempting to cover it up through murder. Think about David's position. What do we do when we have committed great sin like that? Especially when we're in such a public 
position, when God has placed us on a pedestal, what do we do when we commit sin? How do we process it? How do we apply gospel truths to our lives? Well, David teaches us that in a very humble way in Psalm 51. We're not going to look at the, the psalm in careful detail, but generally speaking, we're going to look at truths that we can glean from it. And the first point I want to make is this, David's merciful God. We have to have an understanding of who this God is that we have sinned against. He makes it very clear, against you, you only have I sinned. And does that mean he didn't sin against others? No, but primarily, most significantly, sin is against our Creator, against our God. David's merciful God. Put yourself in David's shoes for a minute. You are greatly blessed of the Lord. He has powerfully protected you from your enemies time and time again. He has warmed your heart to spiritual truths that enabled you to author some of the greatest psalms that we have in the Psalter. You're near to God. You have a, a hunger and a thirst for God. Yet, midway, slightly more than midway through your life, after receiving all of these blessings, you respond with heinous sin, with moral rebellion against your God. What would you do? How would you respond? It's remarkable, the first words out of David's mouth. They would not be the first words out of my mouth. David's done wrong. He knows he's done wrong. Nathan the prophet has said, David, you're the man. And these are David's opening words. Have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy on me. He's not justifying himself. He's simply directing his plea to an attribute, a characteristic of his God. What does he mean by have mercy on me? Well, it's a recognition that he needs God to do something for him that he doesn't deserve, that he hasn't earned. What David deserves is the wrath and curse of God. What David deserves is a strict enforcement of the Ten Commandments. What David deserves is to be stripped from his position of power and executed. That's what David deserves. David deserves to sit and wallow in his guilt and shame for a couple of, of months. That's what David deserves. But David cries for mercy. And then he goes on to say this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Remember your covenant, God. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression. Don't just don't give me what I deserve, but erase it as if it's never happened. That's bold. So have mercy and show me abundant mercy. Two different words for mercy. Derek Kidner in his little commentary on the Psalms says this about what's translated, about the, the Hebrew word that's translated ab abundant mercy here in our text. He says it's an emotional term and it means be moved with compassion. Father, be moved with compassion towards me. Pity me. I know I'm foolish. 
I know what I did is wrong, but show tender love and care for this great, great sinner. Isn't that a beautiful testimony of how to approach God when we are crushed by the weight of guilt and shame because of some foolish, sinful act that we've committed. What would you expect to find in a response, in your first words to God after committing such heinous sin? Maybe I would have been like Adam and Eve or Jonah. God's over there. I'm going over there. I'm going to get as far away from this guy as possible because I have wronged him. I have offended him greatly. Now, I've seen cases in, uh, among sincere, godly Christians. One was a pastor of mine. And for some reason, he started to run from the Lord and question his faith. Well, what happened was it came out that he was involved in a, an extramarital affair. He was running from God. He was scared. And fortunately, he returned and is now serving as a ruling elder in a PCA church in Texas. He's uh, a man a lot like David in, in the formation of my Christian upbringing and learning. A, a man of humble spirit, but really a man on fire for the Lord. Another uh, personal experience, there was a, a pastor in, when I was in Britain. He ate lunch in my home. He preached at our church. He was a prominent figure among British Reformed pastors. He was considered a leader. Well, he committed suicide in a hospital. And it came out that he had been involved in counseling women that developed into affairs. And it wasn't just with one or two women, but I think it, it turned out being about seven. And his response, because of the, the guilt and the shame, and I can understand this being a pastor, the pressure that's placed on pastors to be kind of super spiritual. Uh, in, instead of confessing that to his wife and his children and his congregation and the, the broad reformed church world, he could see no way out but suicide. And I think we can understand that. If we've been in a position like David where we're exalted and we're spiritually considered uh, significant, the pressure is great, but who are we? We're sinners saved by grace. And I think David understood that well, and he testifies to that in this psalm. Such mercy is also inconsistent with our experience. There's very little mercy displayed in our world. When someone does wrong, it seems like their enemies are jumping on it and exploiting it and using it for whatever political gain they can make of it. David was no different, was he? You remember the story Nathan tells him? Oh, he's ready to condemn the rich man for stealing the ewe lamb from the poor man. And he's willing to, ex to take that, that punishment that he wanted to inflict upon that man to a greater degree than God would in the law. So we understand some of these responses, which magnifies the beauty of David's response because it teaches us that he is full of faith and understands clearly the character of his God. His God is a God of great mercy. David is a man of faith. He knows who his God is. And what I would say is, what I would say to you is this, if you find yourself in a situation like David, a, a situation that is embarrassing, a situation that 
is physically affecting you because of the weight of guilt. David committed adultery. That would be a, a, a sin that places us in, in that position in our own culture. Or maybe you've embezzled money from a business and you, you, know, you had a reputation of being a fine, outstanding person. Who knows what the sin is? You're, the devil is going to seek to convince you that you are unworthy of God's love. He's going to exploit your feelings. And what you must do, and what we as Christians on a whole host of different issues, we must learn that our feelings are always subordinate to what the Scripture says about God. Our feelings are always subject to truth. And they can never take the place of guiding us and leading us. They must always be servants to the truth of God's Word. What did David know about God? Well, in Exodus 34, he, he was a man who read the Pentateuch. Exodus 34, verse 6, God passes before Moses. Moses is desperate to see God, and he wants to know who this God is. The Lord passes before Moses, and these words are uttered. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. David has that truth echoing in his mind. And when he approaches God, he approaches God based on the foundations of God's character and his first words are, have mercy. Have mercy because you are a merciful God. 1 Chronicles 16, verse 34, we read of this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. This is how we come before God. I want you to turn to Romans 7. Early on in my Christian life, I struggled with lack of assurance. And really, lack of assurance is, is, is not trusting God, the gospel. Lack of assurance is a, a form of self-reliance. And this chapter, Romans 7, became so important to me. See, what I thought is when you become a Christian, you become perfect. You do everything right. But I knew in my own heart that I wasn't right. I harbored resentment towards people, hatred towards people. Uh, there was lust and all kind of sins. And I was like, I must not be a Christian then. But Paul corrected me in Romans 7. But li listen to what he says in 7.24, and then we'll read eight, uh, through to 8.1. It's only three verses, two or three verses. Paul says, Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? You ever felt that way about yourself? Oh, wretched man that I am. Why do I keep doing these foolish things? Why can't I be better for God? I am a, 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 pure, a poor excuse for humanity. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with the flesh I serve the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. A beautiful understanding by this man of the power of gospel salvation. The second thing I want us to do is look at David's confident request. The foundation of the request is his understanding of the character of his God, the, the nature, the attributes, who he is. Then David reflects on his own sinfulness. And he confesses that he is a sinner from birth, he is a sinner by choice, and he is a sinner by nature. So he started life from his origins as a sinner. 
His choices in life reflect that, and He started life's origins and made choices to sin because His nature is corrupted by sin. That's the biblical orthodox doctrine of sin. Look at verse 3, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgments. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. David acknowledges his sin, and he doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't justify it. He doesn't qualify it. He just says it. And that is freeing to do. When we just admit what we've actually done, quit trying to hide. But it's hard, because our sinful nature as an act of the self-preservation of our reputation doesn't want people to see who we really are. But David doesn't stay focused on himself. He turns to his God. Yes, this is who he is. But he asks God to purge him with hyssop. Verse 7, And I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Beautiful imagery of the, the work of atonement, of blood atonement in the Christian understanding of the gospel. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out my iniquity. He asked for three things. Cleansing from sin, power to overcome sin, and a restoration of his relationship with God. And those three things he receives, those three things you receive through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. David, by taking hold of the promises of salvation, receives cleansing, spiritual, moral cleansing, purging, and washing. And when you come into the presence of God because of the precious sacrifice of Christ, you stand before Him, and when the Father looks upon you, He doesn't see the filth of your sin. He sees the pure whiteness of Christ's righteousness. That is a message that our world needs to hear. That is a, a message that, that you and I need to hear. That is a message that we should rejoice to communicate to others. It's like none other. God honors His request. In Isaiah 43, God writes this through His prophet Isaiah. God says, I, even I, am He who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. David is purified through, for him, the blood that pointed to the blood of Christ, that is the sacrificial offerings in Old Testament practice, we are cleansed through an even better sacrifice, a far superior sacrifice, the sacrifice of God in flesh, Jesus Christ. But David also asked for the power to overcome sin. It wasn't enough for him to be purged and purified. He didn't want to do it again. He didn't want to hurt God again. He didn't want to live in uh, rebellion to God again. There's no true repentance, no true confession, unless we make every effort to turn from our sin. Anything else is to make a mockery of God. Look at verse 10. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart. And what God promises in the gospel, 
What Jesus promises is to cause us to be born again. Jesus promises to take our heart of stone away and to replace it with a, a tender heart, a heart of flesh is what the Bible calls it. A heart that responds to the, the moral standards of God and longs for it. That's what David is asking for. Not only to be freed from the guilt and the shame, but to be freed from the power of sin. And then finally he prays for restoration and renewed fellowship. And this is why we need to practice confession on a regular basis. Because we sin regularly and it distorts our relationship with God. He says in verse 11, Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Why does Christ come? Why does Christ offer Himself on a cross? Why does Christ give us a new heart? Because He wants to create a people who can engage in fellowship and relationship with the triune Holy God. That's his end goal. That's what heaven is about. A restoration of our fellowship with God. God wants to be near his people. And that is a wonderful thing. Let us thank God for his work in the life of David. And I pray uh, for you to, to remember these things in all of your acts of confession throughout your life. But I pray that the Spirit would make these come to mind. If you happen, and I pray that no one would, but if you happen to be in a place of heinous, heinous rebellion and sin against God, that you would remember that does not mean He will not show kindness and grace to you if you will return to Him. Let us pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the testimony of David. We thank You for the Psalms which expose the, the inner workings of a godly man's soul even as he wrestles with sin and confession. Lord, we pray that we would always remember that You are a God of mercy. And that when we approach you, we should seek your grace and your pardon. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We have a fitting hymn to conclude. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. That's number 460, if you'll please stand and sing.
with the blessing of our triune God. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do His will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.